Okay, guys, so today uh, we're going to learn um, a few things here. We're going to learn how to make rocks using a procedural script. Um, we're going to uh, learn how to use a paint tool to actually place objects into your scene. Um, and we're going to learn how to do trees. Uh, we're also going to learn how to do water. So um, all of these uh, things we're going to do today involve installing some sort of software. And this is important also because as you guys um, start progressing with your modeling skills in Maya and pretty much everything you do, there's going to be utilities that are available to you that are going to speed up your workflow and you should know how to install those utilities. So the first one I'm going to introduce you to is a little one in here. So if you copy that software folder over, it is called Displace D. And there's a folder here. This plugin is probably what I would consider a very undocumented plugin. So even if you were to go into this folder and you went to the Displace D documentation where the guy just points you to his website, uh, it's actually pretty sparse as to what uh, it tells you how to install the plugin. So what I want to do is I'm just going to help you kind of figure out um, how to uh, find certain things and where they go. So with Maya, there's two types of helpers that you can put into the software. There's one called a plugin, and that involves kind of installing a piece of software, which is usually in the form of the extension .mll. And then there's things called scripts. And scripts are not actually software. They're just a batch of commands and a text file. And those are with the, un the uh, output or extension .ml. M -E -L. All right, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to just decipher how to install this plugin based on what's actually in these folders. So here I have the Displace D uh, folder, which I downloaded from this guy's site. And I'm just going to look really quickly to see what's available to me. So I'm going to go, it's not Mac OS X because I don't have a Mac, so I'm not going to go in there. And then I can't do anything else. There's these two files. This one just points me to a website. And this one is a folder, so I'm going to start here. I'm going to just start looking. So I'm going to go into this folder, and I'm going to read all these folders. Linux 64. No, my computer's not Linux. So OS X. No, my computer's not a Mac, so I'm not going in there. Ooh, scripts. Uh, Maya runs scripts, right? So I'm going to check that out. Oh, there we go. There's two MEL files. Well, if there's a MEL file and it's uh, tied to a plugin, there's a, only really one place that can go. So I want to show you where that is. So now we're in the scripts directory. So I'm going to highlight to select both of these scripts, and I'm going to just right-click and say Copy. You could also just do a Control-C, which would do the same thing. And what the copy does is it basically takes those two files, it reads them from the hard drive, and it stores them in RAM. So RAM is basically your short-term memory on your computer, and your hard drive is like your long-term memory. All right. So just by copying that, I've temporarily created a, um, a copy of that file in RAM. All right, and if I don't do anything with it, I reboot the machine, that file will go away. It just will be unused. So well, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to the directory where these need to be installed for any Maya script, okay? So we're going to open up another Windows Explorer, and I'm going to go to uh, local disk, and then I'm going to go to users. The path for you guys is student. For me, it's faculty, so I'm going to open up faculty. And then it's my documents. And then it's Maya. And then it's 2012 x64. And then it's scripts. And that's where these files need to be stored. So once I navigate to that position, I'm going to just go ahead and right click and I'm going to say paste. And it's going to paste those files from the buffer right into that folder for me. All right. So we're kind of halfway there. So we went into the folder for the software, and we found some scripts, but let's just investigate the rest of this setup here. So why do we have two folders here, Win32 and Win64? Well, that implies to me that there's further software that needs to be installed in order for this plugin to run. So I know that my machine is not a 32-bit machine. It's actually running 64-bit. So I'm going to go into the Win64 folder. And then we have a whole bunch of folders here. 2008 x64, so 2009, 2010, 2012. Well, those are kind of release dates for Maya, right? If I remember correctly. 
So I'm going to say, well, you know what? I'm running Maya 2012 x64. So I'm going to go click in there. Whoa, check it out. I just found a file called displaced.mll. And I just told you that .mll denotes a plugin, which is actually a piece of software that Maya needs to run. So I'm going to, now that I have that selected, I'm going to right click on it and say copy. And then I'm going to show you where those go. So plugins are a little different from scripts. Plugins are actually pieces of software that Maya needs to run, similar to like an executable file, uh, which is like a .exe. On, uh, so when you launch Maya, that's actually a .exe file. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the local disk. Because this is a piece of software, it needs to go into the same installation fo uh, folder that Maya actually gets installed in, which is at local disk C. Program Files, so I'm going to expand that, and then Autodesk, and then Maya 2012, and then uh, kind of illogically, you would hope that there'd just be a plugins folder in here. There's not. It's actually in the bin folder, so expand the bin folder, and there we go, plugins. So once we navigate to the plugins, all we have to do is right click in here and say paste. And I'm going to paste in the displaced.mll. I had actually had a uh, displaced D in here previously that I didn't delete. So it's just asking me to copy and replace it. So I'm going to say, OK, copy and replace. OK, now that I have all the files associated with this software copied into the correct places for Maya to use them, what I need to do is I need to go into the Maya interface. And I'm going to say Window, Settings and Preferences. Plugin Manager. And when I execute that command, then the Plugin Manager is going to open up. And I'm going to scroll down here and I'm trying to find a plugin in here called Displace D. And so they're all organized in alphabetical order, so it's pretty easy for me. So I scroll down here and I see Displace D.MLL. So I have to do something else before Maya will actually load and run that plugin. I have to tell Maya to load and run that plugin. So I'm going to go to the Displace D.MLL. And I'm going to click on the button to load it and to auto load it. So what that's going to do is it's telling Maya to load the plugin right now, and it's saying auto load the plugin every time I load, every time I launch Maya. So once that's done, I can go ahead and close this box. At this point, technically, you don't have to do this, but I like to do it just because it's. Uh, they say that uh, once you've done that, that the software's installed and it should work. That only works maybe about 50% of the time. So what I like to do is just close the program and reopen it. And this will ensure that the software gets uh, installed properly. So I'm going to relaunch my after closing it. And if I've done everything correctly, if I go to the animation menu set here, and I go to uh, create deformers, at the very bottom I'll have a new menu item called Create Displace D. And we've successfully installed the software. All right, so I'm going to pause for a second and make sure you guys all got it. OK, so now that we have the Displace D installed, again, that's Menu Set Animation. Under Create Deformers, we should see a new button called Create Displace D. And you've successfully installed the Create Displace D plugin. And you've probably installed your first plugin. Congratulations. All right, so now what we're going to do with that plugin, we're going to use it to create water in this case. So I'm going to open up uh, Murphy's scene. And he's got a scene where it's kind of like an island in the middle of some water. So I'm going to go to the desktop, assignment 5, and we'll grab Murphy Arias' scene. And we open it up. He's got his little island, but what he's lacking here is some water to surround it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a polygon primitive, and we're going to do a uh, plane and I just want it to be created at the origin so I'm going to snap right here to the origin and then I'm going to go ahead and scale this guy up let's make this C really big and then I'm going to just move it up so that it basically intersects his landmass so see how the water can rise until oh no uh, so <laughs> We're just going to raise it up to make this thing look more like an island. Let's say that there's a little coastal inlet there. That looks cool. Whatever. 
uh, and now we need some water. So I'm going to go ahead and select this plane, and in order to create water, I need to add more uh, segments so that I can carry the resolution of what water is going to do to this thing. So I'm going to go in here to the history of my plane under the inputs, and I'm going to select it, and I'm going to just dial this up to 256 by 256 so that I have a lot more detail. And then now what I can do here is I can turn this thing into an ocean. All right. And the way I'm going to do that is by I'm going to use that displace D node. What the displace D node does is it essentially takes your object and turns it into a real-time displacement map. So I could put a displacement map on this object uh, using the normal method. So why don't I just go ahead and do that uh, so I can show you the difference in the time savings that you're going to get out of using this guy. Um, so I'm going to select my plane here. And the traditional method would be I'd select the plane and I would say assign new material. I would assign a Lambert. I would then go into the Lambert shading group. That's where you apply a displacement material. And I click on the little checkerboard next to the displacement mat to tell it what to pipe into that to make it to use for the displacement. And I would select, I could do anything here. I could use a file. I could use any of these nodes, but check this one out. What does that say? Ocean. Ocean. Holy crap, right? That's what I want. So I'm going to click on the ocean, and I'm going to pipe that node into it. But notice like nothing happened. So the, my plane still stayed flat. I know there's an ocean shader on it, and if I look at the ocean shader, I can see there's all these crazy parameters that I can adjust if I pull this down. I've got all these crazy parameters, but if I adjust any of these, nothing's really happening. I can see my little tile here updating, but I don't see anything happening on my plane. What I have to do to see anything happening on my plane, I'm going to undo all those tweaks that I just did because I want it to be default. I have to come down here into my scene and get low to the ground. And I have to go ahead and render this. And it takes minutes, usually longer than minutes, because displacement maps kind of take a while to render. OK, so I had to start over with a clean scene. Uh, but I basically have an island here, and I have an ocean shader, which is doing a real-time, or not a real-time, it's doing a displacement map um, to it. You already saw how problematic that was, because that took, like, way too long just to get everything tweaked. And if I did my ocean this way, this is definitely not a real-time process, and I'd probably end up pulling my hair out or just giving up. Uh, so what I want to do is show you how to do this uh, same operation, but this time I'm going to use a displace D. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and go back to uh, Murphy's scene. I'm brave. I'm going to do it. Prove that there was nothing wrong with this scene. And I'm going to go ahead and create a poly primitive. And I'll do a plane here. And I'm going to subdivide it. What happened was on that was um, I subdivided the plane to 256 by 256, which is absolutely great for the displaced D node and is absolutely terrible for a displacement map uh, in Maya. And so what happened was this is way too dense for a displacement map, and it totally killed the software. So uh, for displaced D, this is excellent, and I'll demonstrate that right now. By I'm going to select my plane here, which is going to represent my ocean. I'm going to scale it up a little more, though, because that would be a very small ocean. And then I'm going to go ahead and go to the animation menu set, create deformers, and I'm going to say create displace D. When I do that, we can't really tell that anything happened. But if we look in the scene, if I go to wireframe, if I hunt around, you can see this little node here, which is this little like triangle with an arrow pointing upwards. And that basically denotes that in fact, there is a displace D applied to that plane. And then if I select that, see how the plane is in pink? That tells me that there's some sort of input connection from this guy to my plane. All right. But now I still have to hook this thing up. So I'm going to select the mesh. I'm going to go to the attribute editor by hitting Control A. And the attribute editor is kind of where you get to any connections that are on your object, input or output. And right there, if I do control A on this plane, there is an input node called displace D1. And it's got 
a few options here. So if I pull that down, we have Displace D1 node on this plane. It has an input channel for color, which we're used to seeing. That's usually uh, an indication that we could input a, a map or a shader or something. It's got a strength here. And then down here, it's got a couple buttons, which are pretty important. The first one is Displace Direction. And it's Use Normal is what we want to use. And what that's going to do is it's going to use the face normals of my plane for the direction for for displacing the material. So in that case, it's going to be straight up. And this is an ocean, so that's perfect for us. So I'm going to click on Use Normal. And then I'm also going to click on Use UV. And what that means is it's going to use the texture coordinates for this plane. If I don't click on Use, v, use UV, it's actually going to assign a material to each one of these squares individually. And if you ever don't click that, you'll see that you won't really be able to change the size of your ocean. It'll just kind of stay one constant size. And that's because you're not using the texture coordinates of the plane to distribute it. So you definitely, these are very important. You want to click Use Normal and Use UV. Once that's done, now we can go over here to the color channel. And we can click on this little checker box next to it, which is going to allow us to pipe in a shader or a material. In this case, we're going to use the ocean shader. And when we do that, now look what happens. Immediately, my plane distorted upwards, and we can see kind of a texture on it. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab this guy, and I'm going to move it back down into position. And now we can start kind of adjusting these wave parameters under the ocean shader to get the desired effects we want. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a way. Right now, if I go in and grab the uh, ocean shader off of the attributes of the object, the problem I have there is that I can get to it, but see how the object's still highlighted? So I can't really see the changes I'm making. But if I go to the window, and I go to Rendering Editors, and I go to the Hypershade, if I click on Textures, here's that ocean shader. Look what happens when I double click it. The ocean shader is active, but it deselected my plane, which is now going to allow me to change the parameters of the shader while still seeing the updates. So I'm going to go over here into the ocean shader, and I'm going to start playing with some of these settings. So the first thing we have is scale, and that's basically the scale of the ocean. So see what happens when I start driving it up. The waves get uh, closer and closer together. We then have time. This is more or less an animation effect, so you don't really want to mess with that when it comes to a modeling parameter. See how this is really cool, man. This plugin is amazing. It's basically allowing me to do a real-time displacement map, which is kind of unheard of. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Then you have wind UV. You don't really want to mess with that again. That's an animation control. Uh, we have observer speed, which is also an animation control, so you don't really want to mess with that. We have number of frequencies. If you play with this, you can basically um, add more turbulence to the water. Uh, wave direction spread. Uh, you can play with this. I believe this just um, changes the spread, so how far the waves are apart. And then we have wavelength, min, max. And basically, the closer you make this, the bigger the waves will get. Or if you dial this back, you'll have small waves and also large waves. So it's probably best to, to keep that similar to the default settings. And then down here we have the wave height. This is super cool because it just allows you to drag this node. And look what happens. We, yeah, we can go from calm seas to high seas. Uh, at this point, my plane might be a little bit under res. But again, the cool thing about this node is everything has a history. So if I wanted to, and my computer could handle it, all I'd have to do is select the plane and come over here under the polyplane node and increase the number of segments. And hopefully I'll crash the machine. And there we go. And check it out. It updates. So I'm going to go back in here into the Displace D shader. Again, I'm going to do that by going to Window, Rendering Editors, Hypershade. And I'm going to go to the Textures tab in the Hypershade and double click the ocean shader. And then now I can change those parameters on that shader and have my mesh deselected. So we have wave height, that's where we left off. And I kind of dial that up way too tall. 
Was it? There we go. Uh, it's taking longer to update now because I upped the resolution of my plane. So let me just, I really wanted to illustrate that you could do that and how cool that was, but uh, it's not so cool now that I can't work. So I'm going to go back here to the history and I'm going to change this maybe to like 312 or something instead of uh, 512. So, and then I'm going to go grab my rendering node, Hypershade, Ocean. And here we go. We can get back to, I got my wave height, so I can change that. And you're just going to do this until you find something that's kind of realistic for your environment to your scale. You have wave turbulence, which is basically also how rough the sea is, so we can calm it down. So that would basically just create like a directional wave going through. Or kind of a rough seas, which is probably what the ocean's more like. Especially if you're out in the middle of the ocean with an island. And then you have the wave peaking. And this is basically, you can also add extra nodes to these. And this would basically make it so your wave kind of comes to a peak left and right. And uh, basically forms like more of a conical shape. Foam emission, foam threshold, those are things for materials. We're not really using materials in this uh, class. And that's essentially it. I believe the alpha gain is disconnected for this. So in a normal displacement map, if you increase the alpha gain, it's going to increase the height of the displacement. In this case, it's been kind of unmapped. So the way that you can change the height of this node is to actually go into the displace D. And you're going to use the strength setting. So if I wanted those waves to be higher, I'd have to go ahead and do it through the displace D. So in this case, I'd probably take it back to a 1. And that's kind of realistic. Other cool thing about this is that, let's say I wanted to paint on this guy um, and sculpt it further. So I wanted to create some like breaking waves coming in or something. Uh, because this is actually a piece of geometry, I don't recommend doing any sculpt surfaces on this while it's got that node in, on it. So what I would do is I would just go ahead and create a layer for this guy. And then I would duplicate it. So control D, make another copy. And then use the duplicated copy, which look has no history. And then from there you could right click on it and say paint, sculpt. And then open up the sculpt setting. Turn off the wireframe so that we can see what we're doing. And then if you wanted to like create some breakers, I'm probably not going to do these that great, but um, so I'm trying to do it as fast as possible. But let's give it a shot. So I'm going to use the paintbrush here. And I'm going to use um, first normal as my type. I'm going to use the pull. I'm going to use the softest brush. And I'm going to just go ahead and Create a breaker here, so there's part of it. I also probably don't have sufficient geometry to do this, but uh, first normal, so I'm going to wait until my vector is pointing this way. And there's really not enough resolution on this. Right. So it's not going to work. But um, if I did have enough resolution on this plane, I could. You can also put another plane in just below this. So if you did want to model a bunch of breakers in there, you could put a, a higher resolution plane underneath and then sculpt it out so the breakers are coming up over the water. And then go ahead and apply an ocean shader to that to give it a little bit more um, uh, variation. And there you go, you got your ocean. So that's one down. This also works incredibly well for the hand model. So if you were a person who was trying to do a displacement map on your hand model, you can also apply a displace T to it, and you can check your displacement map in real time rather than having to go through the rendering process, uh, which is ridiculously tedious. And I just didn't show you that previously because uh, i got to show you, you guys things in increments so that you can digest it all. All right, so the next thing we want to do is I want to introduce you to another tool that kind of automates things for you. And this one is just a script. So we're going to go into uh, that same software folder that you copied over earlier. And there's one in there called RockGen V2. 
And if you just double click into it, this one's super easy. It's just a script. So we're going to select that script and say copy. And then where does the script go? Can anyone tell me? Script folder, which is always C, users. Uh, for you guys, it's student. For me, it's faculty. My documents. Uh, Maya 2012 x64 and then scripts and we're going to paste it right in there so there we go we've got the rockgen.mel script pasted into the scripts folder and now we have to um, actually load it so typically they say you don't have to do this they say that um, you can just type in here now rockgen in the mel command input here and if I do that the authors of the script would probably tell me that that was all I needed to do, was just copy it into the script folder and then type rockgen. Well, see, that didn't work. It says cannot find procedure rockgen down here in the error. So what I need to do, what I always like to do whenever I'm installing a script, is I source the script, which basically is telling the software, hey, there's a script here, and don't forget it. I remember this path to this script and load it pretty much every time. So I'm going to go over here to the script editor, to the bottom right. I'm going to open it up. And the script editor opens up. And then under the file for the script editor, I'm going to say source script. And then I'm going to navigate to that folder where I put the rockgen script, which is users, faculty, documents, Maya, 2012x64 scripts. All I have to do is double click that script. Now Maya has kind of a permanent path to that script. And the next time I type rockgen down here in the command line and I hit enter, it's actually going to open up the RockGen dialog box. All right. So let me. I want to come around and make sure you guys all got it installed. So this script is uh, kind of cool. Uh, if you've ever modeled rocks, um, it's not really fun. It's kind of like being a prisoner out in the yard and breaking rocks. Um, so this little script kind of makes it easy, especially with you guys on a time crunch. You're trying to build an environment in three weeks. So I'm going to try to give you some tools to help you automate. Um, this is one of so the way this thing works is if you go in here and type it's a mel script so if you go down in here to the mel command all you have to do is type r o c k it is case sensitive so you got to watch it so it's lowercase r o c k capital g and then lowercase e n and then you hit enter and it opens the rock uh, generators uh, dialog box and we're going to start with rock type boulder number of rocks let's just leave this all default and let's just go ahead and say generate and see what happens here. Uh, all you got to do is click a button and you got a bunch of boulders. Kind of cool. So some of the settings here, I'm going to go ahead and delete those. We can increase the number of rocks to like 10. Distribution radius is just how far it's going to space them apart. So if you want them to be closer together, we can take that down to half. And we can say generate and look what it'll do. It'll just put them closer together. If you ever want to reset the settings, there's a little trick to this one. It doesn't actually have a reset button. What you have to do is you just have to flip between the modes and back to the other one, and it'll set it back to the reset setting or the default settings. So I just switched to ports and then back to Boulder, and I got my default settings back. So under, let's just do one rock at a time. So I'm going to do number of rocks one, and then you have height ratio, which is basically going to um, create a taller rock versus a flatter rock. So I believe the higher this goes, it'll create a much taller rock, like so. And the lower this goes, the, the flatter the rock's going to be. I'm just curious what happens at zero, and sure enough, that's a good skipping stone. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to dial it back up to two. Shear is basically just going to make it kind of uh, more sheared off. So if we generate it. It's going to shear it to the side. Uh, 3D noise is just going to make it um, more uh, noisy and varied. See what happens with that distribution radius setting. So because I'm only creating one rock, I had that set up to like 10 or 20. It's creating the rocks kind of off axis. So if you wanted to, if you're just creating one rock at a time. You just want to turn that thing down to zero, and it'll generate the rock right at the origin, which is probably what you want. My advice to you is to um, 
probably just create a bunch of rocks. It's just like if you were out picking up interesting rocks on the, the beach. Uh, you just go and start creating a bunch of interesting rocks until you get like, I don't know, five or ten that kind of complement your scene. And then uh, and then you can start using them uh, as I'm going to show you the next step, okay? So we've got rock scale. That's just going to make them bigger. So if you wanted to make a boulder, you could do that. Um, you have low res or high res, so if you wanted to make a higher resolution, it'll just add more uh, detail to it. I'd be careful with that because that, see that one's a little, so you want to watch out for that. I tend to just stay with the, the low res, and then you can, uh, if you want to res them up, all you got to do is add a poly smooth. Okay, so another cool thing about this is it has different creation methods, so that was Boulder. If you switch it to Quartz and you go ahead and say Generate, there we have uh, Superman's uh, layer, the Krypton or whatever the, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I think I like being wrong about that now, <laughs> just to hear like everyone chime in. It's the Fortress of Solitude, man! So I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know what it is, sorry. All right, so uh, we got the quartz here. Again, number of rocks you can change. So if you wanted to do kind of a sci-fi environment, you can mess with that. Um, good way to automate things. Stalagmite, I, just, I wouldn't recommend using this. It's really lame. First of all, there's a, a bug, and I forgot what it is. I think number you have to change. There's something you have to do to get it to work, but trust me, you don't even want to use it because it, all it does is stacks a bunch of boulders on top of it, and it looks stupid. So don't use that. <laughs> Okay, so that's the rock gen script. I'm going to just load it again because I want to make one rock here. And I want to go back to my default settings. So I'm going to make one boulder. And I'm going to do distribution radius of zero. And I'm just going to generate one rock. Okay, now that I got my one rock, um, we're going to install some more software. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. The next one we're going to do, this one's a plug-in also, but this is probably uh, a more advanced one because this one's actually written by Autodesk. So it actually has an installer, which is your friend. So what I've done here is I've taken you through like all the varying degrees of plugins for Maya. Script being probably uh, friendlier than the one, the rock, uh, the uh, Displace D, which is completely undocumented, not friendly. And then finally, the friendliest of all, which is just a basic uh, installer. So if we go to the desktop where we uh, copied that software folder and go in there, we've got another folder. It's a zip file in there called Maya Bonus Tools 2012. I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to say extract all because that's a zip archive. So it needs to be uncompressed. So I'm going to uncompress it and it's going to create this new folder. And inside of that folder, we got a file here called setup.exe. So I'm going to right click on that folder and I'm going to say run as administrator. If you don't, I'm going to say run. And I had to uninstall it there in order to reinstall it. So it'll come up here and it'll say um, install shield, da 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 da. Just say next. Uh, it'll say destination folder, just accept the default. And then go ahead and say install. It'll go through its little process here. And then if all goes well, it'll say install uh, shield wizard completed. And I'm going to click on finish. And then I get a little message here that says check. It's installed and the bonus tools are installed. So I say done. And then now, if I did it all correctly, what will happen is up here in the main menu, I'll have a menu item called bonus tools. And you kind of want to be a little bit careful because right now I'm in the animation menu set. This uh, menu set actually changes locations depending on what menu set you're in. So if I switch it to polygons, see it switches, it changes its location. It goes right behind render farm, and there it is, bonus tools. So you want to make sure that you have that uh, right. If you're in polygon menu set, right behind render farm, there is one called bonus tools. Okay, so now that we have the bonus tools installed, the utility that I'm after in the bonus tools is called modify paint geometry tool and let me just set this up a little bit so I'm going to go ahead and create a polygon primitive and I'm going to do a plane and 
with this tool, you if you're going to paint onto something, it's got to have some geometry to it. So currently, this plane without any segments is kind of not going to be good. So what I need to do is I need to go in and actually add some uh, edges to it. So I'm going to select it, and I'm going to go into the polyplane input, and I need to add some subdivisions. In this case, I'm just going to do like a 20 by 20 to just give it a little something for the software to work with. And I'm going to turn off that annoying grid. So what I have here is a plane, which is essentially a ground plane. And then I have a rock in my scene. So what I want to do here, is I'm going to move the rock to intersect that plane a little bit. I'm going to go to modify and I'm going to center the pivot on that rock. And now what I want to do is I want to name this rock. So I'm going to go, right now it's called Boulder 1. I don't like that name. So I'm going to click on the channel box and I'm going to just call it rock. Then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select in here and I'm just going to hit a control copy to copy this name rock so that I don't make any typos later. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my plane and I'm going to go into, make sure I'm in the polygon menu set first of all. Then I'm going to go over here to bonus tools which is right next to render farm. And I'm going to select modify paint geometry tool. When I do that this box opens up and it's basically got a cursor here what's blinking and it's saying what do you want me to do? For, so for geometry what, do, what are you going to put in there? I just need to give it a name so I want to make a duplicate of this rock that I just made and I want to do it with a paintbrush and I'm going to do it using this tool but I need to give it a name so I know I just named that rock rock or I know that I also copied it so I could just hit control V and now I know I didn't make any typos or anything so the geometry that I'm going to make duplicates of is called rock, and the software now knows that. And I'm just going to leave everything here at its default to begin with. This tool works just like the Sculpt Surfaces tool. So if I hold down the B, as in boy, key, I can change the size of the brush by dragging left and right. And that's it. This one doesn't really have a vector. It just basically has a size. And then now I can go ahead and paint and check this out. I can, I can immediately populate the scene with a bunch of pebbles. All right, I'm going to show you how to control this a little bit more. But currently we're in create modify mode. Look what happens when I go to remove mode. I can erase. When I go to modify only, I can change the parameters based on painting over what's already created. That's probably less useful. That one is actually kind of not that great. Um, the other thing that you can do is once you've created if you don't like and the remove stops working, which it does sometimes, so you can actually just go ahead and select one of these individual rocks and hit the up arrow a bunch of times and that'll select the entire group and then I can go ahead and delete it. So the first rock that you're using, the source, never really gets to be part of that group because it is the basis that the tool used to create all those other rocks. All right, so let me pause here. Uh, some of you guys have questions. Okay, let's, uh, let's show this tool off a little bit more in detail. So I'm going to go ahead and select my plane. Again, the way you initiate it is you select what object you want to paint your geometry instances onto. And then you say, you go to the menu set, polygons, bonus tools, modify, paint geometry tool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and create these. I want to do this again, but I want to show you a little bit about how to control this thing. So currently... Um, you probably always want to just use create, modify, and remove. This one is not that useful, as I said. We have grid, and what grid does is it basically tells the software to use um, essentially the spacing between the polygons in the scene. So if I unclick grid, it actually gets a little crazy. And what it does is it'll create an instance of this object pretty much everywhere where I have a, a vertex. See how it's all way uniform? And what it's doing if I turn off grid is it's basically creating geometry wherever there is a vertex. That's why it's so uniform there. That can be useful for, for things, but uh, not for this. So I'm going to turn grid back on. And then once we are using the grid, we can use the U and V size. And what that's going to do is it's basically going to either spread the objects out or make them closer together. So I believe if I up the number, it's going to put them closer together. 
And if I decrease the number, it's going to spread them out. All right, so that's kind of nice. Then we have a few other options. So we have grid, which I just showed you the difference between grid on and grid off. Uh, and then we have jitter grid. So if you don't have the jitter turned on, what happens is it basically uh, creates everything kind of uniform. If you turn on the jitter, it's going to jitter these values based on a jitter value. So if I increase this jitter value to like 50%, it's going to basically change the scale or the rotation or the translation of these objects based on this jitter value, which is going to be basically how much it's going to change it from scale to scale or rotation to rotation. So this isn't that obvious until I'm just going to go ahead and recreate this, delete all these, grab this one again, say bonus tools, modify paint geometry. And I want to do grid and I want to jitter the grid. And I want to uh, I want to jitter the scale, so I'll do that. What that means is it's going to create big rocks and it's going to create small rocks. If I increase the jitter value, it's going to create smaller rocks and bigger rocks and there's going to be a bigger discrepancy between the two. So I'll undo out of that. So a jitter value of uh, 0.5 usually works pretty well. I can also jitter the rotations. So if I do X rotation, Y rotation, and Z rotation, look what happens. It's going to start flipping the rocks around, which is much more natural look if you're dealing with rocks, right? And then we have translation. This I haven't found a good use for yet. Uh, watch what happens. If you accidentally click that, what it's going to do is it's going to kind of float the geometry off the surface. So my advice to you guys is to just not ever employ the translate unless you can come up with a good reason to do that, which I haven't had one yet. Uh, what's that? If you had like, I don't know, like if you wanted to make like pieces of ice coming off a soda can and like it was in motion, then maybe that would be a good use. But that's the only thing I can think of. All right, so um, the other thing we have is proportional. And what this box does is basically it will try to create the scale of your geometry proportional to the object that you're painting on. I kind of don't like it. I don't like the software to tell me. I like to um, just pretty much always leave that off. And then I tell it how big I want to make things. Uh, we have attach and duplicate. Um, Probably just you want to leave those enacted because what that's going to do is it's going to attach all these new objects to the geometry you're painting on. And then we have a line which leave these all on. So attach, duplicate, group, and isolate, leave those all on. And then a line, I need to create another scene so I can show you what that does. So we've done this with rocks, that's pretty useful. So a great way for you guys to populate your scene with rocks. You can also do this with grass. So if you create a little grass element. You can go ahead and paint some grass in. You name it, just anything you kind of need to scatter and you don't want to sit there and duplicate it by hand and scatter it, you can do that using this tool. So let's go ahead. I want to show you um, one more value in this thing. And I'm going to go ahead and create a poly primitive. And I'll do a plane. And I'm going to increase the segments here. And I'm going to go into vertex mode. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I want to make it a little bit more. There we go. Increase the follow. I'm going to create like a little hillside. And then what I'm going to do here now is I'm just going to show you guys that you can create complex objects. So I'm going to go in here to the origin and I'm going to create a little tree here. So I'm going to do Polygon primitive cylinder. And I hate this thing. Uh, create polygon primitive cylinder. And then I'm going to give it a little height. And then I don't like the size, so I'm going to scale it down. Scale it up. So just making a little tree trunk here. And then I'm going to create another poly primitive. And I'm going to do a cone for this one. So I'm just making a little pine tree here.
And then I'm going to group these guys. So I'm going to select the top and the bottom. And control G to group them. And then there we go. It's important that whenever you uh, use the paint geometry tool, that whatever you create actually has to be on the zero, zero. If it's not, and the object center is also not on the zero, zero, you will get a little offset between the objects that you paint and um, the paintbrush. So notice I've always been keeping it on the zero, zero. The other thing I want to point out is someone from the other class was thought that I was instructing them this is how to build a tree. And <laughs> started building trees like that, right? <laughs> yeah, they started building trees like that. This is not how to build a tree. Mm -hmm. This is just me showing you how to use a tool and making a cheap little tree to use. So for those of you who are watching this video, do not make your trees like this. Okay, so I made a small tree. And I just want to show you that you can group an object and it still have the tool work. So I have two objects that I've grouped, and I'm going to call this tree. And now I'm going to go in and grab my little hillside, and I'm going to go into bonus tools, and I'm going to say uh, modify paint geometry tool, and I'm going to change it from rock to tree. Now I want to show you another setting here which is the align setting. So I'm going to first paint a few of these without the align setting turned on. And check it out. This is an example of your jitter value. So currently I'm jittering rotation, X, Y, and Z. And look what it's doing. This is great if I was going to do a force that was like bulldozed or something, um, but not good if I'm making a regular force that's healthy. So you might do um, just a little bit of Y rotation, but you probably want to turn off Z and X. And I'm going to paint these trees in here like so. And then look what happens if I'm going to increase my grid size because this is like too sparse. There we go. So right now these are actually being painted in here correctly. So they're on the hillside and they're facing directly up. But check out what happens if I click on a line. What a line is going to do is it's going to have them grow perpendicular to the surface. So this is good for, like, say you're adding spikes to something and you want them, but not so good if you're actually trying to do realistic trees. So watch that setting also. Can everyone see that, what that's doing? It's basically creating the object perpendicular to the surface normal. Okay, because now what I want to do is I want to show you how to build an actual tree. So um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to reset my scene. So now we want to build an actual tree, and um, there's a, a million different ways to kind of build anything, and I want to kind of show you um, the two ways that, uh, actually it's three ways that you can build a tree. And I'm going to use a pine tree because that's kind of easy and simple to get through in, uh, in the class period that we have. So I'm going to go into the top orthographic viewport, and I'm going to create a polygon primitive. And I'm going to go ahead and do a cylinder here. And then I'm going to go ahead and move its pivot to be at the bottom of it. And then I'm going to scale it up. Make it kind of tall. And then I'm going to go in here to the uh, cylinder node and I'm going to add some segments and height just add like four is good and then I want to change the number of subdivision axes to something smaller like a 12 and I'm just making my tree trunk here so now that I've done that I'm going to go into vertex mode and I'm just going to select the, these uh, set of verts here at the top and I'm going to pull this out to give it my kind of pointy top and then I'm going to go ahead and select all these vertices here, and I'm just going to scale them a little bit to taper this guy out. All right, so we get something that looks a little bit like a tree trunk, and then we can add some variation in here, give it a little character if we want to. All right, so we got our little tree trunk here, and now we need to add branches to this. So in this case, I'm going to do a pine tree. 
So you can do this uh, one of two ways. You can actually, you could extrude a circle along a path, or you could just go ahead and use um, another uh, cylinder to do this. So I'm going to do this, I guess, the easy way. I'm just going to duplicate this trunk, and I'm going to lay it down. and then scale it down and create a branch here on the side and then if I wanted to let's say tree branches have a tendency to kind of grow up or because they kind of seek the light so I'm going to go ahead and just model that into it something like that and then um, this is a pine tree as I said so it's going to have needles and I want to kind of increase the amount of geometry on here, so I'm going to go into the Insert Edge Loop tool, and I'm just going to pop some more edge loops in here. And then let's say that I wanted to accomplish the pine needle by physically modeling a pine needle. So what I would do is here, I come down here into the, I'm going to go to the origin in my front orthographic viewport, and I'm going to go to Mesh, and I'm going to say um, Create Polygon Tool. And I'm just going to make a little pine needle. Like so. And I'm going to call this guy really creative pine needle. And I'm going to copy that name, control C. And I'm going to use my little friend, the paint geometry tool, to basically copy these needles onto this branch modify paint geometry tool I typed in my name pine needle I want to set it up to create slash modify um, this can be either on or off I think it doesn't matter I'm gonna leave it on because I actually want to jitter the rotation value a little bit and this time I'm gonna click on a line I turned off grid because I want it to create a pine needle wherever there's a vertex and see how it does that And all I have to do is just keep going along here. I can then also go in here to the rotate settings if I want to vary this. And get a little bit more variation. That's where the create slash modify comes in. It allows me to change what I've already done. Alright, so uh, I'm trying to do this very crude because I just want to illustrate a point. So notice how this is a very basic piece of geometry. And if I go ahead and group these, so I'm going to select one of these needles, hit the up arrow a bunch of times, select the branch, and I'm going to group that branch. Now I'm going to move this pivot point to be up to be the center of my tree here. Now, in order to make this semi-convincing, I have to make a bunch of these branches, right? So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this. And I might go ahead and offset one from the other duplicate another one maybe rotate this one down offset it again and then now I'm going to select all three of those and I'm going to group them change the pivot point and then now I can go ahead and duplicate it and rotate it and then shift D will duplicate with transform and I can do that. I'm going to go ahead and group all these guys again because I need to make a bunch of branches if I'm actually going to make a convincing tree. And I'll group this again. And then I'll hit Control D. And look what's happening. Like with every step that I do here, the scene is starting to bog down. Now it's possible if you say if you had a hero tree, right? You just had like one tree in your scene that you needed to be modeled in detail. You could do it this way and probably get away with it. But if you needed a whole forest in your scene, uh, this would absolutely not be the way to go. And I'm just going to illustrate that. I keep duplicating this thing up.
So we're lucky it actually has not crashed the computer yet. And I think it's because I, I still kept it pretty simple. But you can see here though that this thing is like slowing down to a crawl. So again, if you wanted a model one tree like this, you could probably get away with it in your scene. But you better not count on um, using the paint geometry tool to place them or actually having more than uh, a few of them in your scene because it's going to kill everything. Can you just delete the history on it so it doesn't You can, but it's not going to do that much. So if I go to edit, delete all by type in history, it'll speed it up, but not, a, not significantly. How do you... What's that? How do you do that? How do you speed it up? Well, I mean, like, like the only thing you can do is to select it all since they're all poly objects and go to mesh combine. That'll give you a slight performance increase. But I, my, I guess my advice is just um, to not do it this way. <laughs> Unless you have like one tree in your scene. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a bunch of trees in your scene, why could you do that? No, if you, if you have a bunch of trees in your scene, you're going to want to do it the second way, which I'm about to show you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always baiting you. I try to show you the wrong way to do something, and then I show you the right way. <laughs> And that's good because the reason I do that is because I don't want you to find the wrong way yourself. Okay, so now I want to show you a second way to make a tree, which is much easier and also much lighter on your scene. And that is to use a texture map to do it. All right. So uh, I want to create a pine tree. So one cool thing about um, texture maps for trees is that people have kind of already done the work for you. So I'm going to go to Google Images, and I just want to show you the long way to make a, a texture image for a tree. So if I go to Google Images and I just type pine tree in here, it's going to produce a bunch of pictures. Now what I'm looking for here, see how these already have a consistent white background? Uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for, so that's actually ideal. Uh, so that's a nice one, and it's super high resolution. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Okay, so I finally got this picture loaded. So what we're looking for is a tree picture, and you can do this not only with a pine tree. You could do this with uh, any tree. You're just looking for an image that kind of has a consistent background. So I've got this image. I'm going to right-click on it and say Save Picture As. And I'm just going to go ahead and save it to this temp folder on my desktop. And then I'm going to open it in Photoshop. So I'm going to go Launch Photoshop. And I'm going to go ahead and open up this picture. So I'm going to go into the select color range. I'm going to select any one of these white pixels, and then I'm going to increase the fuzziness until it's 200, the very highest. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. And um, I could control X to cut the background. And now I can see that I've separated it out so that it is transparent. And then I'm going to hit the control key to on, and select that layer which is basically going to load that selection. So in order to tell other pieces of software what's transparent and what's opaque, other software uses the channels, and it uses a thing called an alpha channel. So see here how we have an RGB, and then a red, a green, and a blue. These are All the RGB is is basically the multiplication of all three of those channels together. And if we want a transparency channel, we have to add one by clicking on the new channel button. And see what happens? It creates a new channel called alpha. And the way an alpha channel works is that anything that's black is transparent and anything that's white is opaque. So I want the tree to be opaque, so what should I fill that with then? White. So I'm going to hit control backspace to fill that with white. And that's going to basically create my transparency channel now for this image. So now that I'm done with that, I can bake this. I don't need that thing separated. I just did that to show it to you. So I'm going to merge those layers. And then now I can save this. So I'm going to hit Control and Shift plus S to save a copy of this file. And I like to use TIFFs for Maya uh, with transparency. So I'm going to scroll down here to TIFF. And then I'm going to give this a descriptive name. I'm going to call this Pine Tree 
mask underscore one dot tiff. Um, I want to include alpha channels, so you want to make sure that box is selected. You don't want to include layers when you're saving a TIFF into Maya. Maya doesn't like the layers. Maya also does not like compression. So if that's set to LZW, you need to make sure you turn that to none first. So we'll do none. And then you also have to make sure that you discard the layers and save a copy. So I'm going to say OK to that. Now that I have my texture map saved, I can go into Maya and I can create a polygon plane. And in this case, I'm just going to do it in the side viewport here. And I'm holding down the shift key to make it completely square. And then now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to assign a material to it. So I'm going to say assign new material. And I'm going to do a Lambert because I don't want any specularity on this. I just want it to be flat. And then I'm going to go under the color channel. And I'm going to click on the little checker pattern for me to apply a uh, an input into that. So I'm going to click on that. It says, what kind of input do you want? I need a render node. So then I'm going to say file, because I'm going to create, I'm going to link to that file that I just created and saved as a TIFF. So I click on file. I'm going to go to the image name portion, click on the folder to navigate to it. Desktop temp, I believe what I called it was pine tree mask 01. So I'm going to go ahead and apply it. And nothing happens, and that's because we have to turn on texture view within the viewport, and we can do that by hitting the 6 key. So if I hit the 6 key, look what happens. We got my pine tree mapped on there. It's transparent. You can see through it. The only thing that's kind of wrong with it is that it's maybe a little uh, flattened out, so all I have to do is scale it up like so. And then let's say that you wanted to change the way that this uh, was basically the texture was being displayed onto the polygon itself. So the way you would do that is you go into the window UV texture editor. And basically, I just want to show you how this works. So if I click on here and I say UV, notice that all the UVs, if I select them, they're the little green dots, are within this one-to-one -one space. So anything that's going to accept a texture map always goes within this one-to-one -one box. And if I wanted to distort this or change it in any way, all I have to do is select these verts. Or they're not verts, they're UVs. And I scale them, and I can make a tile. If I wanted to make it so it was skewed to the left or right, all I have to do is move it. So if I wanted to line my trunk up with the trunk in my image, I could do that here. And you want to distort it, uh, you can do whatever you want. So that's how you move the texture map on the actual plane, is by messing with the UV coordinates. All right, so now this isn't very convincing, though, as a tree. I only have one, so it looks great from this angle if I render that. But the moment I come here to the side and re render again, that's not really great. So what I need to do is I need to what? What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm going to duplicate it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Control D and then E. And I'm going to rotate it. For these, you kind of want to stay in a zone of, say, between 30 degrees and 45 degrees is probably fair. For this one, I'm going to use 45. And then I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate with Transform. And so what I've done is I only have three planes here. But now I have basically something that's going to look like a tree from more angles than previous. All right, But you can see how it does kind of break down if I get in an angle here. Where, actually, that looks pretty good. I'm going to try to find it. I want a broken angle. That's kind of a broken angle. See how you can see that plane? All right, so the next thing you can do here is you probably want to create another set of planes based on these planes and fill in. And the way you're going to do that is I'm going to duplicate one of these guys and rotate it down like so. And I'll just move it out here for a second so you can see what I'm doing. So what I have right now is I got the branches from the side, and that's been a pretty decent um, representation. However, I'm going to go and add kind of the filler for the lateral branches. And I'm, you, I could go and make a new texture map for that, but that would, you know, require a lot of work. So I'm just going to kind of reuse this one and scale it down. And I'm going to use this to make kind of more branches. Ingenious. It's so simple, it's hard, right? 
so then I'm going to go ahead and place this. And what you're trying to do is you kind of want to fill in, see where there's those voids. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that in. And then I'm going to duplicate this again and rotate it. And this would be a good time for me to change to world mode rather than local so that I can move these without having to worry about them. And then I'm going to do a shift D. Uh, that didn't work because I deselected it first. So I'm going to grab one of these. I'm going to duplicate it and rotate it. And now I'm going to do a shift D. Make a couple more of these. I'm being pretty uh, loose about how I'm doing this because I'm trying to get through the demo. So I'm going to go ahead and group them now. And now that they're grouped, I'm going to duplicate them one more time. Move them up. I can start varying them here. So I could scale them up or down. In this case, I'm going to go down a little bit. You could rotate it. Control D. Up, scale it down, rotate it, rotate it off axis a little. Basically, the more variation that you put in, and the more tree like you make it, so you can just uh, get some reference of a tree and kind of study the way the branches flow. And the more you follow that, the better it's going to look. So I just kind of did this rough in a way that uh, this is kind of how most people do low poly trees. Uh, if I spent you know another hour on this, I could probably have it looking a whole lot better. And that's a lot better if I go farther away. See, not bad. It's getting better every time. So the next day, the next phase of this would be probably me just adding more variation to the shape. You can also subdivide these shapes. So if I went ahead and went into Edit Mesh, Interactive Split. Oh, no wrong one. Uh, Polygons. Edit Mesh. I want to insert edge loop. So if I went ahead and added some edge loops, you can actually start distorting this plane. If we go into vertex mode, and you can even get more subtle effects. So if I, whoops, added some more shape to this, and I can grab this one, kind of bend it off to the side, etc. And you'll get, uh, basically, the more you do stuff like that, the better it's going to look also. And you would do that to all the branches. All right, the next thing and the final thing I want you to do, I don't want you guys' scenes to have any color whatsoever. So right now I'm using this green uh, alpha texture. And I want to turn that to gray. So the way I'm going to accomplish that is by going over here into Photoshop. And if you just hold down Control and Shift and hit the U key, that's the shortcut for desaturate. And I think you can also get, I, I've used this shot key for so long, I don't even know where it is in the menu. Uh, I think it's uh, image, adjustments, desaturate. There we go. Control Shift plus U. So desaturate. And that's what I want yours to look like. I just want it to be a gray representation. So now I'm going to go ahead and I held down Control Shift plus S, which is save as a copy. And now I'm going to save this uh, file again. This time I'm going to call it pine tree mask underscore BW for black and white. And I'm going to save it again. Discard layers. Make sure there's never any compression on here. Say OK. Now if I go into Maya, all I have to do is uh, get to that material so I can select anything that has the material on it. And I'm going to right click and say material attributes. It's going to open up the material attributes. I'm going to go to the Lambert shader group. I want to go to the color node, so I'm just going to click on the arrow there next to color. And I want to relink now to a new map, which is the BW one that I just made. And I'm going to say reload. And there we go. Now we got our nice little black and white tree. And that's how I want yours to look. In modeling reels, you don't ever want to use any color. Everything's got to be gray. That's how uh, people want to see it. And it's for a reason. Because when it's gray like that, um, you can't hide any any crap or any mistakes. So that's why we want to see it that way. So I'm going to select this mesh now. See how light this is? I'm whipping around the scene. And now I can group this guy. 
And now I can call him or her tree. And then now if I wanted to, I could create a, another plane here. And let's say I want to create a world or a hillside. Make it pretty big. Go into vertex mode. B for soft select. Make some hills. And then, what do you think? I'm going to select the plane. And I'm going to go into bonus tools. Paint geometry tool. Modify. Modify. Paint geometry tool. And I, I call it tree. So I'm going to say tree. I'm going to create modify. I, this time I want to do it based on the grid. And then control, I want to... I want to vary the X, Y, and Z scale, but I only want to do the Y rotate. And then I'm going to leave everything off, including a line. And so it's starting to lag a little bit once I get a few hundred of these in here. But pretty cool though because I just created a forest that actually looks fairly reasonable at this stage in the game in about three seconds. That's yeah, well, not three seconds if you include setup time, but once it's all set up, there we go. And again, you're gonna want to you're gonna want to make your source trees a lot better than what I did. Um, and then you're also never gonna be able to rely 100% on the. Uh, paint geometry tool to place them correctly. What you're going to do is you're going to block it out that way. And then you're always going to have to go in with your camera views and say, OK, there's this tree here, and maybe I want to crook a few here or there, or I want to remove a few or place a few by hand. Uh, and you're going to have to do that. But what this will do is kind of get you to the 90% level uh, you know, right out the door, and then uh, minimize how much time you're going to place uh, or how much time you're going to spend placing everything by hand. Now, from an optimization standpoint, See how it's kind of slow now? You're going to want to kind of do this at the very end of your modeling process for your scene. Uh, and then once you do, you're going to want to create a layer. So I just selected one of these trees and keep hitting the up arrow to go to the top of the group. And you just want to create a layer for trees underscore L. And you just want to keep everything kind of optimized so that you can hide that, so that you can fly around and work really fast. And then just kind of turn that guy on really at the end for render time. And that's it. So if you have a hero tree, once again, you can model a hero tree in detail like I did on the first one. And then uh, for your, your background trees, you're going to want to build them like this. All right? So any questions? Pretty cool, eh?